The Necklace by Gay de Maupassant. The Necklace, 1884, is a famous short story and morality tale that is widely read in classrooms throughout the world. Get more out of the story with our The Necklace study guide. The girl was one of those pretty and charming young creatures who sometimes are born as if by a slip of fate into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no expectations, no way of being known, understood, loved, married by any rich and distinguished man. So she let herself be married to a little clerk of the Ministry of Public Instruction. She dressed plainly because she could not dress well, but she was unhappy as if she had really fallen from a higher station. Seen with women, there is neither caste nor rank, for beauty, grace, and charm take the place of family and birth. Natural ingenuity, instinct for what is elegant, a supple mind are their sole hierarchy, and often makes of women of the people the equals of the very greatest ladies. Maltida suffer. Sis Leslie, feeling herself born to enjoy all delicacies and all luxuries, she was distressed at the poverty of her darling, at the bareness of the walls, at the shabby chairs, the ugliness of the curtains, all those things of which another woman or her rank would never even have been conscious, tortured her and made her angry. The sense of the little Briton person who did her humble work, housework aroused in her despairing regrets and bewildering dreams. She thought of silent antique embers hung with oriental tapestry, illuminated by tall bronze candelabra, and of two great footmen in knees breeches to sleep in the big armchairs, made drowsy by the upset, oppressive heat of the stove. She thought of long reception hall hung with ancient silk, of the dainty cabinets containing priceless curiosities, and of the little coquettish perfume reception rooms made for chatting at five o'clock with intimate friends, with men famous and sought after, whom all women envy and whose attention they all desire. When she sat down to dinner, before the round table covered with a tablecloth in use three days, opposite her husband, who uncovered the soup, tureen, and declared with a delighted air, Ah, the good soup! I didn't know anything better than that. She says of dainty dinners, of shining silverware, of tipsy that people the walls with ancient personages and with strange birds flying in the midst of a fairy forest. And she thought of delicate dishes served on marvelous plates, and of the whisper gallantries to which you listen with a sphinx-like smile while you are eating the pink meat of a trout or the wings of a quail. She had no gowns, no jewels, nothing. And she loved nothing but that. She felt made for that. She would have liked so much to please, to be envied, to be charming, to be sought after. She had a friend, a former schoolmate at the convent, who was rich and whom she did not like to go to see anymore because she felt so sad when she came home. But one evening, her husband reached home with a trumpet air and holding a large envelope in his hand. There, said he, there's something for you. She tore the paper quickly and drew out a printed card which bore their words. The Minister of Public Instruction and Madame George's Ramponier, 
request the honor of Mr. and Madam Lucy's company at the Palace of Ministry on Monday evening, January 18th. Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she threw the invitation on the table crossly, muttering, What do you wish me to do with that? Why, my dear, I thought you would be glad. You never go out, and this is such a fine opportunity. I had great trouble to get it. Everyone wants to go. It is very select, and they are not giving many invitations to clerks. The whole official world will be there. She looked at him with an irritated glance and said impatiently, And what do you wish me to put on my back? He had not thought of that. He stammered. Why, the gown you go to the theater in, it looks very well to me. He stopped, distracted, seeing that his wife was weeping. Two great tears ran slowly from the corners of her eyes toward the corners of her mouth. What's the matter? What's the matter? He answered by a violent effort. She conquered her griefs and replied in a calm voice while she wiped her wet cheeks. Nothing, only I have no gout, and therefore I can go to this ball. Give me your card to some colleague whose wife is better equipped than I am. He was in despair. He resumed. Come, let's see us, Matilda. How much would it cost? A suitable gown which you could use on other occasions Something very simple. She reflected several seconds, making her calculations and wondering also what sum she could ask without drawing on her sailed an immediate refusal and frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally, she replied, hesitating, I don't know exactly, but I think I could manage it with 400 francs. He grew a little pale, because he was lying aside just that amount out to buy a gun and treat himself to a little shooting next summer on the plan of nature with several friends who went to shoot last day of a Sunday. But he said, Very well, I will give you 400 francs and try to have a pretty gown. The day after ball drew near and Madame Lucille seemed sad, uneasy, and anxious. Her frock was ready, however, her husband said to her one evening. What is the matter? Come, you have seemed very queer these last three days. And she answered, It annoys me not to have a single piece of jewelry, not a single ornament. Nothing to put on. I shall look poverty striking. I would almost rather not go at all. You may wear natural flowers, said her husband. They're very stylish at this time of year. For ten francs, you can get two or three magnificent roses. She was not convinced. No, there's nothing more humiliating than to look poor among other women who are rich. How stupid you are, her husband cries. Go look up your friend, Madame Foster, and ask her to lend you some juice. You're intimate enough with her to do that. She uttered a cry of joy. True, I never thought of it. The next day she went to her friend and told her of her distress. Madame Foster went to a wardrobe with a mirror, took out a large jewel box, brought it back, opened it, and said to Madame Russell, Choose, my dear. She saw first some medlets, then a pearl necklace, then a Venetian gold cross set with precious stones of admirable workmanship. She tried on the ornaments before the mirror, hesitated and could not make up her mind to part with them. To give them back, she kept asking, Haven't you any more? 
Why, yes, look further. I know what you like. Suddenly, she discovered in a black satin box a super diamond necklace, and her heart throbbed with an immoderate desire. Her hands trembled as she took it. She fastened it round her throat, outside her high neck waist, and was lost in ecstasy at her reflection in the mirror. Then she asked, hesitating, filled with anxious doubt, "Will you lend me this? Only this? Why? Yes, certainly." She threw her arms round her friend's neck, kissed her passionately, then fled with her treasure. The knights of the ball arrived. Madame Lucille was a great success. She was prettier than any other woman present, elegant, graceful, smiling, and wild with joy. All the men looked at her, as her name sought to be introduced. All the attaches of the cabinet reached to waltz with her. She was remarked by the minister himself. She danced with rapture. With passion, intoxicated by preacher, forgetting all the triumph of her beauty, in the glories of her success, in the source of clouds of happiness comprised of all this homage, admiration, this awakened desires, and of that sense of triumph which is so sweet to woman's heart. She left the ball about four o'clock in the morning. Her husband had been sleeping since midnight in a little deserted anteroom, with three other gentlemen whose wives were enjoying the ball. He drew over her shoulders two wraps he had brought, the modest wraps of common life, the poverty of which contrasted with the elegance of the ball dress. She felt this and which. To escape so as not to be remarked by the other women who were enveloping themselves in costly furs, Lucia held her back, saying, "Wait a bit, you will catch cold outside. I will call a cab." But she did not listen to him and rapidly descended the stairs. When they reached the street, they could not find a carriage and began to look for one. Shouting after the cabman, pressing at a distance, they went toward the scene in despair, shivering with cold. At last, they found on a quay one of those ancient nightcaps, which, as though they were ashamed to show their snobbiness during the day, are they were seen round Paris until after dark. It took them to their dwelling in the Rue des Martyrs, and sadly they mounted the stairs to their flat. All was ended for her. As to him, he reflected that he must be at the ministry at ten o'clock that morning. She removed her wraps before the glass so as to see herself once more in all her glory. But suddenly she uttered a cry. She no longer had the necklace around her neck. What is the matter with you? demanded her husband, already half undressed. She turned distractedly toward him. I have, I have, I've lost Madame Foster's necklace. She cried. He stood up, bewildered. What? How? Impossible! They looked among the folds of her skirt, of her cloak. In her pockets, everywhere, but did not find it. You sure you had it on when you left the boat? He asked. Yes, I found it in the west room of the minister house. But if you had lost it in the street, we should have heard it fall. It must be in the cab. Yes, probably. Did you take his number? No. And you? Did you notice this? No. They looked thunderstruck at each other. At last, Lucifer put on his clothes. "I shall go back on foot," said he, "over the whole route to see whether I can find it." He went out. She sat waiting on a chair in her ball dress, without string to go to bed, overwhelmed without any fire, 
without a thought. Husband returned about seven o'clock. He had found nothing. He went to police headquarters, to the newspaper offices, to offer a reward. He went to a cab companies everywhere. In fact, thither he was urged by the least spark of hope. She waited all day in the same conditions of mad fear before his terrible calamity. Lucille returned at night with a hollow, pale face. He had discovered nothing. You must write to your friend, said he, that you have broken the clasp of the necklace and that you are having it mended. That will give us time to turn around. She wrote as she wrote at his dictation. At the end of the week, they had lost all hope. Lucille, who had aged five years, declared. We must consider how to repress that ornament. The next day, they took the box that had contained it and went to the jeweler, whose name was found in it. He consulted his books. It was not I, madam, who saw that necklace. I must simply have furnished the case. Then they went from jeweler to jeweler, searching for a necklace like the other, trying to recall it, both sick with chattering and grief. They found in a shop at the Paris Royal a string of diamonds that seemed to them exactly like the one they had lost. It was worth 40,000 francs. They could have it for 36. So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days yet. And they made a bargain that he should buy it back for 34,000 francs in case they should find the lost necklace before the end of February. Lucille possessed 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He would borrow the rest. He did borrow, asking a thousand francs of one, five hundred of another, five roots here, three roots there. He gave notes, took up renewals, obligations, deal with usurers, and all the rest of lenders. He compromised all the rest of his life, risked signing a note without even knowing whether he could meet it. And frightened by the trouble yet to come, by the black misery that was about to fall upon him, by the prospect of all physical privations and moral tortures that he was to suffer. We went to get the new necklace, lying upon the jeweler's counters, 36,000 francs. When Madame Roussel took back the necklace, Madame Foster said to her with a chilly manner, You should have returned it sooner. I might have needed it. She did not open the case, as her friend had so much feared. If she had detected the substitution, what would she have thought? What would she have said? Would she not have taken Madame Lucille for a thief? Thereafter, Madame Lucille knew the horrible extent of the needy. She bore her part, however, with sudden hair seemed that dreadful debt must be paid. She would pay it. They dismissed their servants. They changed their lodgings. They rented a garret under a roof. She came to know what heavy housework meant and the odious cares of the kitchen. She washed the dishes, using her dainty fingers and rusty nails on greasy pots and pans. She washed the soiled linen, the chest and the discards, which she dried upon a line. She caressed the slopes down to the street every morning and caressed up the water, stopping for breath at every landing, and dressed like a woman of the people. She went to the fruiterer, the grocer, the butcher, and basket on her arm, bargaining, meeting with impertinence, defending her miserable money, sou by sou. Every month, they had to meet some notes, renew others, obtain more time. Her husband worked evenings, making up a tradesman's accounts, 
and late at night, he often copied manuscripts for five souls page. This life lasted ten years. At the end of ten years, they had paid everything, everything with the rest of usury and the accumulations of the compound interest. Madame Lucel looked old now. She had become the woman of impoverished households, strong and hard and love, with frosty hair, skirts askew and red hands. She talked loud while washing the floor with great switches of water. But sometimes, when her husband was at the office, she sat down near the window and she thought of that gay evening of long ago, of the world where she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How strange and shameful is life! How small a thing is needed to make a ruinous! But one Sunday, having gone to take a walk in the Champs Elysees to refresh herself after the labors of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman who was leading a child. It was Madame Foster, still young, still beautiful, still charming. Madame Lucille felt moved. Should she speak to her? Yes, certainly, and now that she had paid, she would tell her all about it. Why not? She went up. Good day, Jean. The other astonished to be familiarly addressed by his plain good wife, did not recognize her at all and stammered. But, madam, I do not know you must have mistaken. No. I am Maltida Lucille. Her friend utters a cry. Oh, my poor Maltida, how you change. Yes, I have had a pretty hard life since I last saw you and great poverty, and that because of you. Of me? How so? Do you remember that diamond necklace you lent me to wear at the ministerial ball? Yes. Well, well, I lost it. What do you mean you brought it back? I brought you back another exactly like it, and it has taken us ten years to pay for it. You can understand that it was not easy for us, for us who had nothing. At last it is ended, and I am very glad. Madame Foster has stopped. You say that you bought a necklace of diamonds to replace mine? Yes, you never noticed it. Then they were very similar. As she smiled with a joy that was at once proud and ingenuous, Madame Foster deeply moved to her hands. Oh, my poor Maltuda, why, my necklace was paste. It was worth at most only 500 francs.